Did I expect the revolution to be led by Gary Lineker, Alan Shearer, Jermaine Janas, Alex Scott and the commentators of Match of the Day, plus essentially the entire sports department of the BBC? No, I did not. But you know what? Needs must. A little pricey of what's happened because this is such an important moment. Such an important moment. What this entire episode has done is expose the political nature of the BBC in very, very vivid technicolour in a way that is now impossible to deny. This is a very educational moment. It must be an educational moment. A bonfire of illusions. Now, Gary Lineker was suspended, and it's important we say this, suspended by the BBC for exercising his free speech as someone on a freelance uh, contract who is not a political journalist in critiquing the despicable war in rhetoric and policy waged by the Conservative government on some of the most vulnerable people on the face of the earth. Now, originally, the BBC just lied to us, as far as I can tell, because they suggested that he'd agreed to step back until a new, new social media policy um, had been agreed with him. Now, he had to publicly make it clear that he'd been forced into that position. He's been suspended by the BBC. There's no mutual agreement here. Now, that's plunged the BBC into crisis because... For some reason, the BBC didn't anticipate that his colleagues would look at that and think, absolutely no way. And they have refused, across the board, to take part in sports coverage. A de facto general strike in the BBC sports coverage. That's the consequence of what the BBC has done. I don't know how they're going to dig their way out of this, but this just shows that Gary Lineker and his colleagues have to stand their ground. They cannot allow themselves to be defeated. Now, I'm not going to be gaslit on this anymore. Because what is going on here is gaslighting. That is when people try uh, to uh, suggest or make you believe that what you know to be true is not actually true. But we can see with our own eyes and we can hear with our own ears the actual reality here. There are two words, two words, which completely destroy the BBC when it comes to what they've done and destroy any argument they have, any moral high ground they have, those two words are Andrew Neil. Andrew Neil used to be the main political journalist, the main politics presenter of the BBC. Now, Andrew Neil, in that capacity, chaired, so he was, at the same time, he was the flagship politics presenter. He was the chair and remains the chair of a hard right magazine, The Spectator. I'm not going to have people now responding going, oh, The Spectator's not hard right. I think a, a magazine which publishes articles defending Greek neo-Nazis, which has articles such as in praise of the Wehrmacht, which argues there is not enough Islamophobia in the Conservative Party, as well as articles which are essentially white replacement theory, I think we can agree, if that isn't hard right, then nothing is hard right. Now, in the past, viewers complained about him, because he used his Twitter feed to clearly express right-wing political opinions, but he was chair of a magazine, which was hard right, he just tweeted out all their hard right articles on his Twitter feed, but he also at one point denounced Carol Cadwaller, an observer journalist, as a Matt Cat Lady. A Matt Cat Lady. Now, when people complained about Andrew Neil, what they said is this. Andrew Neil is a freelancer and his Twitter account is a personal one. The BBC is not responsible for its content. We'd also point out that on Twitter, Andrew states that his views are his own <clears throat> and that he's the chairman of The Spectator. That means that his tweets publicising The Spectator are related to his role there and unrelated to his work for the BBC. While carrying out his responsibilities for the BBC, he always adheres to the same rules of impartiality as all other presenters. What are you talking about, BBC? Because <clears throat> Gary Lineker's on the same freelance contract. He's he's not staff. He's on a freelance contract in the same way that Andrew Neil was as well. And actually, what the argument here is, well, actually, the way to get around, because they say, well, the difference is he's he runs a right-wing magazine. So, th therefore, he can express a, a diff a, the, his political opinions, because as well as working for the BBC, he's also the chair of a right-wing magazine. So what, does Gary Lineker have to become the chair of a left-wing magazine? If he becomes chair of a left-wing magazine which denounces the Tories for being a bunch of racists, then would the BBC go, well, it's fine, he can say what he wants now because he's, he's chair of a left-wing magazine. Do you know what? They wouldn't do that, would they? No, he wouldn't be able to be chair of a left-wing magazine. In fact, the idea that you would have a political presenter at the BBC who's the chair of a radical left-wing magazine is absolute nonsense. Nobody thinks that would have happened. That whole incident in of itself exposes the lie of BBC impartiality. It is fine if you are associated with right-wing politics and you work in the politics department, but if you are, essentially in Gary Lineker's case, a liberal and you express liberal political opinions, when you're a sports journalist, you're not even, you're not even doing any coverage of those issues, you're not talking about politics when you're on air, then that's absolutely unacceptable.
That is straightforward hypocrisy. They don't have a leg to stand on. It is an open and shut case. Now, I actually asked Rob Burley, who is now at Sky, but he used to be the guy who was in charge of the political coverage. So he worked, obviously, with Andrew Neil. Andrew Neil's programmes were those produced by Rob Burley. And to be fair to him, he's, just, you know, reasonable guy. He said, all I'd say is the inconsistency between the Sugar Neil as was position and Lineker's when it comes to treating is unfair and inexplicable. This should have been sorted out ages ago, but it was left to detonate. However, I worked with Andrew Neil and he was not biased on air. Now, obviously, with all due respect, that last part isn't relevant. It doesn't matter if you argue or believe that Andrew Neil was impartial on air because nobody thinks that Gary Lineker's political opinions are going to interfere with what he thinks about who's manager of Man United. It's not relevant. So Gary Lineker isn't going on air denouncing the Conservatives, so it's not obviously at all relevant. The fact that Andrew Neil could express right-wing political opinions with no punishment and actually be defended by the BBC when a sports journalist whose remit is not politics, it's not uh, it's not for him to do the same thing. Another example, Alan Sugar. Alan Sugar, again, BBC. Vicious attacks on Jamie Corbyn when he's leader of the Labour Party, including once when he airbrushed Corbyn sitting in a car with Adolf Hitler with the caption, when you put it, pictured at Nuremberg and claim you thought you were going to a car rally. I mean, to be honest, Alan Sugar's Twitter feed is a burning skip. The stuff he tweets is just unbelievably ridiculous. We can get, let me get going, because this is, this, this is really important about how for so long a bunch of right-wing newspapers run by very right-wing men and who, who have tried to drive home the idea that the BBC is left-wing. And the reason they've done that is, A, by constantly terrifying the BBC, they think they can constantly keep them in line because there isn't any equivalent pressure coming from the left because you don't have lots of left-wing newspapers in Britain. And also because they're so used to right-wing views dominating the media because they dominate the newspapers, they actually genuinely think that anything that isn't right-wing is unacceptable, illegitimate, and a violation of neutrality and objectivity, which they think is being right-wing. That's what's happened here. I mean, look, Nick Robinson, again, former chief political correspondent, former head of the Young Conservatives. Who are the people who were, who were, who were employed by the Conservatives as their spin doctors? Former BBC staff, Boris Johnson, hired. Gitta Harry, former BBC journalist. David Cameron, hired. Great Craig Oliver, again, one of the main political uh, editors at the BBC. George Osborne, who did he employ? Former BBC producer, Thea Rogers, ended up marrying her. Theresa May, Robbie Gibb, we'll talk about Robbie Gibb <laughs> shortly. Robbie Gibb used to work um, as chief of staff uh, to a conservative uh, shadow cabinet minister. Then he ended up being in charge of the Westminster coverage. He used to do Rob Burley's job, so the politics coverage of the BBC. Then he ended up working as Theresa May's spin doctor. Then he ended up helping to found GB News. And now he's at the BBC. And he got denounced by Emily Maitlis as an agent of the Conservative Party. Lewis Goodall, the former BBC journalist, has also made it clear that Robbie Gibbs' physician was constantly going after him on the idea that uh, Lewis Goodall would th represented a threat to impartiality because he was seen as too uh, left of centre. I mean, this is just so ridiculous. Another example, Allegra Stratton. She used to be Newsnight um, political journalist, went to ITV, then she ends up as spin doctor for the Conservative government. Not with very good consequences for either her or the Conservative government for that matter. Now, the Director General, Tim Davey, who says this is about delivering on impartiality, he's previously a Tory candidate. He was former Deputy Chairman of the Hammersmith and Fulham Conservative Party. The chair of the BBC, Richard Sharp, donated 400 grand to the Tories and facilitated an 800 grand loan for Boris Johnson. This is a piss take. This is a complete piss take. The BBC is riddled with right-wing people, right-wing powerful men who shape and dominate that coverage and who are cl clearly, given the revolving door between the BBC and the Conservative Party, you can't argue there is a clear demarcation between conservatism and the BBC. The BBC is, all the evidence there, and I think the evidence is absolutely overwhelming, is clearly infiltrated with right-wing ideas and people who are right-wing political ideologues. That's why they don't like Gary Lineker, because not because they think he's a threat to impartiality, but because he's not expressing right-wing political opinions, because if he did, then he wouldn't suffer these consequences. Now, finally, I do want to talk about the actual substance of what Gary Lineker said, 
which has been misconstrued. He wasn't saying it was like the Nazis, what the Tories were doing. He said the language used was reminiscent. If you don't want to be compared to what the Nazis did uh, in terms of their rhetoric, not what they did, their rhetoric, then don't talk about migrants and refugees invading your country, which they're not. Invasions are, take, are, 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 are done by armed, hostile armies, not desperate men and women who are fleeing persecution. Nicole Lampert, a journalist, went on GB News to say, if you have to invoke Hitler or the Nazis, you've already lost the argument. It actually denigrates what happens and what the Nazis did to Jewish people and minorities. Is this the same Nicole Lampert in 2018 said, I think most Jews are seeing echoes of 1930s Germany and Corbyn mania. We complain about anti-Semitism and are told it smears and we're making it up. Every new anti-Semitism scandal leads to rallies of people singing Jeremy Corbyn. They tell us we are the problem when we are afraid. Sorry, Nicole. What? Just hold on a minute. I thought we weren't supposed to use these parallels between Nazism. So what you've said in 2018, you thought was completely legitimate, but it's not legitimate when talking about the language used against refugees and migrants. What, what's, what's the difference? I mean, Jeremy Corbyn wasn't talking about, didn't you, he didn't use language like Jews are invading the country, which would have been a despicable anti-Semitic thing to say, which would have been comparable to the sorts of things that the Nazis said in the 1930s. What's, the difference is, you think it's acceptable to use that comparison against the left, but not against the right. Now, the Holocaust Education Trust chair, Carol Pollux, said, however passionate we feel about important and pressing issues of the day, comparing those current concerns with the unimaginable horrors of the Nazi period is wrong. Now, the brilliant, my friend, journalist, a Jewish journalist, Rachel Shabby, said, this is plainly wrong. A key tenet of Holocaust education is never again for anyone. The Holocaust is unique, but never again is universal. Drawing out similarities and parallels is critical and part of the education. Let's remember, by the way, and that's so on point. But let's remember the Holocaust survivor, Joan Salter, who challenged Suella Braverman. And Joan Salter said that when she hears Braverman use words like invasion, um, that she's reminded of the language uh, used to dehumanise and justify the murder of my family and millions of others. Let's think about what the Auschwitz Museum said, which is that Auschwitz did not fall from the sky. Auschwitz took time. The industrial murder was at the end of a long process which began with the coining of the idea. Words and propaganda reinforced stereotypes and prejudice. Legal exclusion and dehumanisation was followed by escalating violence. We're not living in Nazi Germany. Of course we're not. But when you hear the relentless dehumanisation of refugees and migrants, it is important to look at horrifying examples from the past and where they led. Because all of the worst horrors of human history did begin with words. And if we are going to learn the lessons from our history, which I'm afraid to say those with power want us to do completely the opposite, but if we are going to learn from our history, then we do need to learn how the worst horrors that our species has inflicted on itself, how they happened. And they did happen because people who were desperate and vulnerable were stripped of their humanity. And it is not grotesque to make that point. And in the vacuum left by a Labour leadership unwilling to take a moral stand against the hysteria against a very small group of desperate people in a world where the vast majority of those who are desperate do not come to Britain. In fact, Britain takes in far fewer than France or Germany for that matter, let alone the poorest countries on the face of the earth. It has fallen to the sports department of the BBC to take a stand instead. That itself is a low point. But what this exposes is that the BBC is no den of leftiness. It is under the thumb of right-wing ideologues who, as we've seen in the past few years, have marginalised the left, have treated the left as politically illegitimate, and decided that they weren't going to stop there. They were going to also now target people who are liberals, middle of the road as well. That's what this is all about. Building a country which is a hostile environment for anyone except those who have right-wing political opinions. And the BBC is part of that. If you believe the BBC was left-wing, if you believed it was somehow liberal, then I think this whole episode is a very, very valuable lesson. Please like, subscribe, support us on patreon.com forward slash I'll see you soon.